to have a doctorate of Mawad. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, one of the very early, the earliest actually, I think the earliest among all the church fathers we're going to speak about on this uh, revival. So we had four church fathers so far. This is the earliest of them, and actually the earliest of all, even the coming ones. He goes back to the late first century, early second century, and one of the very profound and simple, I mean, his, his writing, you take an assignment every night to, to read something. This would be the easiest, the most spiritual, the most simple, but the most, the deepest concerning his love and commitment to the discipleship of Christ in the form of martyrdom. So uh, we're, ha we're happy to have Dr. Atif to talk about St. Ignatius of Antioch. St. Ignatius of Antioch. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, congratulations uh, for the, uh, the uh, great season of St. Mary. This is the St. Mary Church. Huh? So, uh, um, uh, Dr. Atif is going to speak. Uh, Dr. Atif is going to speak in, in English, but we have a handout that has been handed over, to, uh, handed down uh, in Arabic for the, the same uh, talk. في معانا ورق بالعربي وموجود على التربيزة ورا اللي يحب لل الدكتور عاطف يتكلم إنجليزي بس اللي يحب يتابع بالعربي في موجودة ورقها على التربيزة ورا اللي يحب يتابع معانا. Uh, again, I congratulate you because this is the great season of St. Mary and this is the only St. Mary church in the Chicago area. So we are honored to be here in this church. I hope you are all enjoying this great season. Uh, when Abuna David talked to me and asked me about the uh, church fathers right away i said if you want me to talk i don't mind talking about ignatius or polycarp because i know they're very early on and i was very fond of both of them for many years um, you know church fathers are a great link between the lord and his apostles and the rest of the generations when the Reformation came with the Protestants and Martin Luther, they somehow tried to ignore all the traditions as much as they can because they considered that human beings have corrupted things through the ages. From what they have seen, whether justified or not, but things did not go well with the church in uh, Europe, in the West. So what they did, they tried to get away from all the traditions and all the history. <clears throat> it's very unfortunate because we know that by many writings from the first and second and third and fourth century and all the centuries after that, which are very authenticated that these were people that were the link, immediate link between the Lord himself, the apostles, and the very early church. So when they say the church did this at uh, the uh, 12th century or 14th century, we do not uh, have to believe all that, we go back to the early history. The earliest of those fathers is Saint Ignatius. Saint Ignatius was the very first of those disciples of the apostles. And to tell you how early he is, he was actually born in around year 35. And the Lord was crucified around the year 33 or so. So, in essence, he was 
born around the time that the Lord was crucified, risen, ascended, and the Pentecost. Great time for Christianity, for this child that just was born, but he was pagan. He was from Antioch. Antioch of Syria is a, a very well-known uh, city. You read it in the uh, Acts of the Apostles. Uh, I, I don't want this to be a, a sermon. I want you to be interactive. And I know you know a lot of this information. And I don't want you to sleep because the darkness and the night and the monotony will make you sleep. So I want to ask you, what was so special about Antioch of Syria? Talk, talk, talk. Somebody has to raise his hand and talk. Yes. Anybody? OK, Feriyad. <laughs> Anybody? Speak up. Early Christian. What happened in early Christians? When I finished the early Christian, huh? they were called very good. If I was like Ambabulus, I would give him a gift now. <laughs> huh? They were called the Christians first in Antioch. Before that, what were they called? Anybody knows what the Christians were called before they were called Christians? The people of the way, that way. At-Tariq, the people of the way. Huh? You with me? So Antioch was an extremely important city in the spread of Christianity. And you remember after the first trip, missionary trip of Paul and, uh, and uh, Barnabas, they came back and they were uh, going to Jerusalem to ask them about the Gentiles, how they deal with them. And what happened? They sent from the Jerusalem meeting two people with Paul and Barnabas in order to go to Antioch to tell them what exactly the rule of the church in this matter. So Antioch was the the door to the spread of Christianity to all the world, to the Gentiles, to everywhere in Asia Minor, in uh, North Africa, in uh, Italy, the whole civilized world of that time. So Antioch was the place where Saint Ignatius was raised. He was pagan, then he became a Christian, and he became a, a disciple of the beloved Saint John. Saint John, the disciple himself, he had Saint Ignatius as his, his disciple. So not only he was disciple of Saint John, but also he, in due time, Saint Peter himself appointed him as the first bishop of Antioch. That's why many times we uh, uh, the name Ignatius, Ignatius Zekka, Ignatius Iwas, the, the patriarchs of Antioch, they always have that prefix of Ignatius because of their first bishop, Ignatius, just like St. Mark in our uh, church. So Ignatius was a, a very simple man, as Abu Namor was saying, very simple man. We don't even know much about his childhood or his uh, sermons or anything in his church. But what we know is very few things and then the profound letters he wrote on his way to his martyrdom. And we'll go through this now. I need help because my eyes are not so good. So you, you read the, the gospel very well. You come and help me out. And I want you to get a microphone and read 
the uh, okay read for me what I prepared here Read. He is a disciple of St. John the Beloved. St. Peter the Apostle ordained him bishop of the city of Antioch in Syria, the center for the early Christians and from which the missions went to the rest of the Gentile world. And, and that was around the 60s, the year 60s. And you know, in the 60s, it was the time where Neron was the emperor and the big fierce persecution was happening. And what happened at that time is that they took uh, Paul and Peter and they were executed and uh, Paul uh, by beheading and Peter by crucified head down as he wanted that way. This was in the late 60s, you see. So around that time, a little earlier, a few years earlier, he became the bishop of Antioch. Mm. Read. He was the first of the Apostolic Fathers, the generation who were disciples in the hands of the Apostles. He was okay. born... Next one. He was born approximately between the year 30 to 35 AD. Yeah. Next of one, I said all next. Next one. Hmm. Uh, he, was, he was ordained bishop in the late 60s. Uh, we do not have much information about his life for his remarkable, remarkable trip from Antioch to Rome to be martyred. Good. Next one. The Trisagion hymn, a vision appeared to him while in a dream where the angels were singing the hymn of the Trisagion, Agios Othios. Okay, hold it for a minute now. You see, the Agios Othios, the famous hymn we say every time we meet for a liturgy, originates from Saint Ignatius. While he was at a dream, he saw the angels singing this hymn beautifully. As soon as he woke up, he brought his congregation and said, here is a hymn. I want you to sing it in the church every time you meet. That's Agios Othios, Agios Eschiros, Agios Asanatos, and Lysonimas. And guess what? This hymn spread to the rest of the Christian world through what Ignatius transmitted to Antioch. And it spread very fast, as, as a matter of fact, it is there for 20 centuries now, everywhere in the world. Ignatius was the one that originated this hymn. Hmm. His encounter with Emperor Tra Trajan and his representative, the Perfect of Syria. Emperor Prefect Sh of Syria. The Prefect. Sorry. Prefect. Emperor Trajan, his reign was between the years of 98 to 117 AD. When the emperor realized the danger of the spread of Christianity in the empire, he brought Ignatius and interrogated him about the crucified Christ. You see, Trajan was a very wicked emperor. Domitiano Adia Trajan. Trajan was near the end of the first century. At this time, of course, uh, Ignatius was already starting to be an old man. And in between his uh, travels, he landed in uh, Syria, of Ant uh, in Antioch of Syria. And he realized that a great danger for his empire by the Christianity, new faith, is Ignatius. So he brought him to him. Some say it was Trajan, and some say it was his uh, deputy, the prefect of Syria. At any rate, he sat down with him and said, Ignatius confessed to him that he is the Theophorus carrier. Theophorus. Always he called himself Theophorus. Theophorus means Theo, means God, Phorus means carrier the carrier of God. Everywhere he goes, he calls himself a carrier of God. And he did not deny it in front of him. He said, carrier of God. Well, the emperor thinks himself is a God. So he asked him, who is this God? 
He says the crucified Jesus. What? A condemned criminal by the emperor and by Pontius Pilate, by Rome? What are you talking about? You deny him. Then? When the emperor could not convince him to deny the Lord, he condemned him to be executed. He so, ordered... after he couldn't get anywhere, he condemned him with execution. And he said, you must go all the way from Syria to Rome in order to be put in the arena. You ever went to Rome to saw the Colosseum? They used to have thousands of people sitting there watching the Christians being devoured by the wild beasts, lions, and so forth. And so he, he go ahead. He ordered that he should go to Rome to be thrown to the wild beasts to be eaten and to be a subject of entertainment to the spectators. So, unfortunately, the spectators used to be entertained by this sight. However, Ignatius, as soon as he heard that, he was full of joy. What did he say? He knelt down and said, huh? Thank you, Lord, because you granted me the honor of your deep love. You permitted me to be bound with iron chains like your apostle St. Paul. As a matter of fact, he said, I'm waiting. I've been waiting so long for this gift. He considered himself to be martyred or to be executed in the name of Jesus Christ as a great gift that he was looking for it for many years in his life. Next. After finishing his prayer, he kissed the chains and pleaded to the Lord to preserve the church which the Lord had entrusted him to serve for 40 years. For 40 years. At that time, he served the church in Antioch for 40 years. Next. The road to Rome. The guards hurried the saint to travel under severe protection by the 10 cruel soldiers. These soldiers were extremely harsh. They were ordered to be very cruel to St. Ignatius. And the Christian spectators or people uh, watching this used to give the soldiers money in order to be easy on him. And he responded to the soldiers by being very gentle and considering their cruelty as a gift from God. Hmm. St. Ignatius was accompanied by two members of his church who were Rufus and Zosimus. Rufus and Zosimus. They were both condemned to be executed with him, two of his congregation. Hmm. When the soldiers found the overwhelming farewell scene, they increased their cruelty toward him in contrast with his gentle response toward them. The Christian people were giving soldiers money to treat St. Ignatius with kindness. Good. Next. His meeting with St. Polycarp. Where is the, where is the, the uh, map? Where is the map? I wanted the map, but I don't know where it's gone. There is a map that tells you the route. He went from Antioch, Syria, went all the way through Asia Minor until he ended up in the famous stop for him were in Smyrna. Smyrna is a city today that is called Izmir. Izmir, Turkey now, and it's a, a, a city on the Aegean Sea, hmm? in other parts of the Mediterranean. Smyrna, which is Azmir at that time, was an extremely famous and an important uh, center for Christianity. And you remember, it was one of the seven churches that St. Uh, John wrote in the Revelation. Hmm? Smyrna. It's famous, a famous bishop was Polycarp. Polycarp was an extremely important early father that I would have loved to talk about him too. Polycarp was a man that was able to write and preserve many of the documents of the late first century and early second century. He was younger than St. Ignatius, but he and St. Ignatius were both disciples of the Apostle St. John. So they were sort of brothers. 
He, Ignatius is the older brother and he is the younger brother in Christ. And they ha both have so much love for one another. So when we, he stayed in Smyrna, guess what? The soldiers were extremely agitated because at that time, most of the people from all the surrounding region in Asia Minor came when they heard that Ignatius is coming to Smyrna on his route to martyrdom. Came to hear him talk and to see, see the blessed Ignatius of, uh, of uh, Antioch. Read. In Smyrna, a great number of clergy and the Christian people from all the surrounding churches came to see a glimpse of the Holy Saint Ignatius and hear his sayings and sermons. He wrote four letters and left for Troas where he wrote three more letters. So, while he is there, he did not sit idle. The few days he stayed there, he wrote his famous letters, first four letters he wrote. And then, when he left Smyrna and went to Ruas, Ruas is a little north, you see, on the, uh, on the sea, he wrote three more. And so, therefore, we have seven letters, very precious letters of Saint uh, Ignatius. Later on, many centuries later, there was another six letters that because they did not appear very early on, they consider them not exactly authenticated. But I'm gonna read for you some of these letters because it concerns Saint Mary. His martyrdom in Rome. Before his arrival to Rome, St. Ignatius sent a letter to the Roman Church begging them not to do anything to delay or commute his sentence. St. Ignatius said a famous saying, I consider yeah. myself... Slowly, loud. People are almost sleeping. Come on. Very good. St. <laughs> Ignatius said his famous saying, I consider myself as the wheat to be ground by the teeth of wheat the wild beast. Wheat to be ground. Wheat to be ground, this is, this is something that makes you shiver. He considered himself the wheat to be ground. And from the wheat you make bread. And he considered himself an offering to God through his martyrdom. Read. To be ground by the teeth of the wild beasts in order to offer myself as pure bread of, to Christ. Continue. On the day of his martyrdom, they bound him in the arena with two hungry wild lions. They put him with their chains and two hungry wild lions. And of course, the arena is full of people to see this great uh, cruel scene that we, we know now about our forefathers, the Christians. Hmm. St. Ignatius was smiling as if he is hurrying to the heavenly city to kiss his beloved Lord Jesus in his glory. The wild beasts attacked him and ate his flesh until his remains were only some bones. Some of the believers took the bones and buried them in his small church in Antioch. There are only bones that were left at that day. The lions ate his flesh totally and left only the bones. And you know the, the scene when I read that he was smiling and peaceful as they, the, the wild beast came, reminds me so much about the film of the 21 that were executed in Libya three or four years ago. You know, that book that says the 21, there is a, a famous book now about this. The German guy that saw this video could not believe himself. How could a person ready to be executed has a peaceful face and smiling before, during, and even after they executed him, the uh, Daesh or ISIS? He saw this and he was stunned. He said, I don't know what kind of face and what church this this man came from, or these people that were executed. 
and he right away looked into the Coptic Orthodox Church. He went to Egypt. He went to Upper Egypt near Armenia. And uh, he went to the little village from where the 21 came. And he went to their church to look and see what kind of faith these people were raised in. He attended the liturgy and have some beautiful comments. And this is probably the best I have seen as a witness for our faith in the Coptic Orthodox Church as I will ever see it. The book is now translated into English and it's a bestseller. The thing is, this same description about Ignatius for 20 centuries happened again because of the faith of someone, a villager who is simple man from Upper Egypt. Mm. In the era of Emperor Theodosius the Young, his bones were transferred to the cathedral which was erected in the place of a pagan temple in Antioch in the fifth century. So when Constantine the Great came and the empire became uh, Christian, and uh, in the fifth century, as Theodosius, the emperor who was Christian, came about, he ordered that the temple in Antioch that used to be a pagan temple became a big church, and they put with great honor the bones of St. Ignatius in that temple in Antioch. Hmm. Excerpts of his sayings. Okay, now we, we go a little bit about the few things that I, uh, I selected from his sayings that we can contemplate in tonight. Mm. I prefer death for Christ Jesus, who died for me and rose from the dead for me. In place over any riches of the world, he is my only desire. You see the depth of the Christian faith that was not just as they say, faith is not a noun, it's a verb. You cannot say, I believe, and there is no fruits for the belief in, in, uh, in our actions, our behavior, our strong faith that will make us do the impossible and be able to deny ourselves, carry our cross, and follow him. Here is a man that with the simplicity of faith, he could not remember anything except the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says more. Mm. Christianity is not to, conceive, to convince the people with my personal thoughts or my clever Listen to this now. Sayings. See? Say it again. Christianity, Christianity is not... To mm. convince the people with my personal thoughts or my clever and eloquent sayings but to invite them to share in the greatness of Christ. Therefore, I plead to you to pray for me so that I do not fall in the sin of influencing people by my eloquent speech, but to learn how to speak with humility so that I can influence them by the beauty and love of my Lord Christ. So we all, the servants of Christ, should take heed and listen to St. Ignatius. We all are not here to show you how clever we are, but how much Christ has done the great deed for each one of us. We are here as uh, earthen vessels. And what he's saying is, pray for me so I don't fall into this sin that I make myself known to you and I don't transmit Christ. That's the first lesson we take. Next. His defense against the heresies of Gnosticism and Docetism. Docetism. Docetism means appear. You see, appearance. So, Gnosticism was a very uh, profound heresy in the uh, second half of the first century and went, went on. And there were even Gnostic uh, uh, Gospels and it was, it was something that the church was trying to defend against fiercely. And he was one of the heroes of defense against Gnosticism. One of the 
of the uh, uh, sites of or the sides of Gnosticism or something called Docetism. What is Docetism? It's not true. It appears. Jesus Christ is not true body. He appears to be so and so and so. So therefore, he is not a human body. He was just appearing as a ghost or, or a spirit and doing all this, but he's not really become a human being. Remind you of something. This is an old heresy, docetism. Here is a man that knew from St. John and St. Uh, Peter that Jesus was crucified. He lived through an era very close to the time he was crucified, was raised, and he was trying his best to defend Christianity against this very bad heresy. Hmm. St. Ignatius said, Christ was truly crucified. It was not a phantom or imagination or deception, but he truly died, was buried, and rose from the dead. Okay, next, yes. So the second thing is we cling to what our, uh, our forefathers gave us and not deviate from any of our beliefs and traditions. Is saying about St. Mary, whoever is devoted and sincere to Our Lady and Virgin St. Mary cannot be lost or perish. So I think this is very appropriate during the season of St. Mary. And these letters were actually uh, written or appeared in the sixth century. So they don't know why it was not from the early first century. For whatever it's worth, this is the only thing in existence that shows you a letter that St. Mary herself wrote. Here, you read it. But read it slowly, please, and loud. Letter of St. Ignatius to Virgin Mary. You ought to have comforted and consoled me, who am a neophyte, a new, com new convert, and a disciple of the beloved John. For I've heard things wonderful to tell respecting your son, Jesus, and I am astonished by such a report. But I desire with my whole heart to obtain inform information concerning the things which I have from you, who was always intimate and allied with him, and who was acquainted with all his secrets. I have also written to you at another time, and have asked you concerning the same things. Farewell, and let the neophytes who are with me, be comforted of you, and by you, and in you, amen. This, of course, should have been while he was maybe 20 years old or so, because we know St. Mary uh, passed away about 15 years after the Lord was crucified. So, but the thing is, for what is, he says, I wrote to you before, but he did not answer. Now St. Mary answered him. The reply of the Blessed Virgin Mary to this letter. The lowly handmaid of Christ Jesus to Ignatius, her beloved fellow disciple. The things which you have heard and learned from John concerning Jesus are true. Believe them, cling to them, and hold fast the profession of, the Christianity, of that Christianity which you have embraced and conform your habits and life to your profession. Now I will come in company with John to visit you and those that are with you. Stand fast in the faith and show yourself a man, nor let the fierceness of persecution move you, but let your spirit be strong and rejoice in God your Savior. Amen. Amen. I thought it's very interesting, for whatever is worse, I saw something, whether it's true or being corrupted, I'm not sure, but it's a letter written from St. Mary to St. Ignatius, and she's urging him to take care of himself and stand fast against all the persecutions. And she told him that all the things that you heard from John about my son is true and I'm coming with him to visit Antio. I don't know whether this is, as I said, it is not authenticated letter. It's one of the 
six extra letters they found later. Mm. خلاص. We finish? No. Huh? He's saying about the Eucharist. Yeah, saying about the Eucharist. I have no taste for the corruptible food, nor to the pleasures of the world. But my only desire is the divine bread of God, who is the body of my Lord Christ, who came from the seed of David. And also my desire is to drink his honored blood, which was shed to indicate his true love to me. You see, again, the Eucharist was instituted from the Last Supper and was practiced continuously at least on the first day of the week. We see the apostles doing that and we see that St. Paul even earlier wrote that in 1 Corinthians. And it, 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 anybody that tells you that this is only for memory is not, is not the true faith of the church from early on. His, the Eucharist to him is extremely important because with the Eucharist, he's taking the Lord to himself. And he says something else. His final prayer. His final prayer is very impressive. Mm. My Lord Jesus, my love and my Savior, who is, in, who is inscribed deeply in my heart, if they cut my heart into small pieces, if they cut my heart in small pieces, huh, your they, name, my Lord Christ, will be imprinted on every small piece. The name of the Lord Christ will be imprinted in every piece of my cut out heart. Mm. Thank you. It was very good. I enjoyed you and I haven't seen you for a long time. Thank you. Uh, so what we learn finally from St. Ignatius is number one, our Christianity is authentic. It is there from the beginning. It's exactly the same as at the time of the apostles. And St. Ignatius and the uh, apostolic uh, fathers are the best link that tells us that and their writing is very early on. Number two, that we should be transmitting Christ and we should be hiding, as, as, as he says, please pray for me so that I do not hide the Lord, but I transmit my Lord Jesus Christ to you. Number three, the Eucharist is very important in our life, and it should not be taken lightly, because here is, he, he knows that Every piece of his body, every piece of his heart, he has the name of Christ imprinted in it. So when we take the Eucharist, we cannot take it as a, just a habit, as a nice little blessing. It's not so. And as St. Paul said, it's very bad to do this, to take it without the proper preparation and you take it undeservingly, you are guilty in the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. May God have mercy on me and on you because we have to meditate in all this. And the last thing is the man's humility and ability to withstand all pain for the Lord Jesus Christ. Many times, any little annoyance will start complaining about it and saying, where is God? Here is a man that lived all his life, a difficult life, but he was joyful all the time. May God bring the spirit of St. Ignatius to each one of us and also the blessing of our mother, St. Mary. His blessing be with us all.